we hear quite a lot about the interplay of superconductivity and spin orbit coupling in quite a lot of different systems. For example, in many of the strongly correlated superconductors, it is known that effect of spin orbit are quite important in determining what kind of superconductivity will be in the material and in other properties. We heard quite, quite a lot in the first day, and in general, we know that in the case of topological superconductivity, spin orbit coupling is quite essential. And also, in recent development in heterostructure and superconductivity in, eto in oxide heterostructures, it, it is also known to, the, to have a quite strong spin orbit coupling in the system. And also there, spin orbit coupling is believed to have a very large effect on superconductivity. So altogether, there are many different effects coming from the interplay of superconductivity and spin orbit coupling, and I'm going to concentrate on two different things. One is basically the unique relation that are created, that are induced by spin orbit coupling between the phase of the superconducting order parameter and magnetization in the system. And the other one is the fact that this kind of relation is actually stabilizing a finite momentum pairing state in the superconductor, both in the presence of magnetic field, but also, as I will show, it can also without any magnetic field presence in the system. And my work is basically motivated by a few experiments. For example, the first experiment is done on films of beryllium. Basically, films of beryllium of different thicknesses, beryllium becomes superconductor, and on top of this beryllium, they are sprinkling gold. Gold just induces spin orbit coupling in the system, and they can measure how the critical field, parallel critical field uh, applied on this beryllium field is changed as they are going uh, into thinner and thinner samples of beryllium, or in other words, as they are increasing effectively the spin orbit coupling in the system. And basically what they see is that as the films become thinner and thinner, the critical field is just going to be larger and larger. Now, without any gold, the critical field would be somewhere here, irrespective of what the thickness of, this, of their sample. So basically, here they can see that the critical field exceeds way above the Pauli limit of the system. The other experiment is also done on thin films. Now, these are thin films of lead, which are also superconducting, but have already spin orbit, strong spin orbit in them. And what was done in these films, they were applying, again, parallel magnetic field. But now at temperatures which are already slightly above the critical temperature of the sample, and they were looking at the resistance as a function of this magnetic field. And basically for different temperatures above TC. And what they see is that for certain range of temperatures, they are starting at zero field with finite resistance. However, as they are applying a field into the system, the resistance drops back to zero. So basically, they are enhancing TC by applying magnetic field into the system. And they can plot it differently, just as how the change of TC depends on the parallel magnetic field, both just numbers and the percentage of the in increase in the critical temperature. And what they see here is the TC grows by 8%. And actually, it will depend on they try that on different films of different thicknesses. As they are going to thicker and thicker films, the effect disappears, and there is some maximum for the effect for quite thin films. Now, one possible explanation for such an effect is if there are magnetic impurities in the system. Basically, if there are magnetic impurities, they are suppressing TC, now, as, we are applying, as they are applying magnetic field to the system, the spin impurities are just aligned with the field, and therefore they become now just conventional impurities 
in, instead of spinning POT, so they don't cause any pearl breaking effect, and therefore TC will go up. It will be possible in this kind of films that have spin orbit coupling because, as we see, the critical field is quite high. So the magnetic field is not damaging much superconductivity, but just helping by aligning the magnetic impurities. So basically, in order to test that, what they were doing, they were taking the, the films, one of the films, and putting more magnetic impurities into the system, basically doping it with chromium. And they had different films, the same thickness, but different um, just doping, dens uh, doping density of chromium. And they can see now without magnetic field how basically TC is suppressed with increasing number of magnetic impurities. And they can test again what happens when they apply mag magnetic field. If the scenario is correct, now they should see that the more magnetic impurities they have in the system, the enhancement of TC is going to, compared to the zero field TC, is going to be larger and larger. But, okay, so what do they see? So here, that's the initial film without any additional magnetic impurities. And they see here, for example, it's the enhancement of TC is by 14%. Here it's quite small amount of magnetic impurities. They see still quite large enhancement, maybe a little bit smaller. However, as they are going to higher and higher doping levels, for example here and here, they see that the enhancement, instead of going up as we predicted, if the effect is because of magnetic impurities, is actually going down. And finally, in the largest, um, concentration of impurities, basically they don't see any enhancement. TC is going down with the magnetic field. Okay, so it seems to be that the effect is not uh, magnetic impurities, as because magnetic impurities actu actually have an opposite effect. So what actually it can be? So in order to look at that, let's go back to basics. And what we have in mind is, is to model the system in the most simple way to think about electronic spectrum, parabolic type, single band electronic spectrum, where we will, can look at the spectrum, at the Fermi energy. We can add a Rashba type of spin orbit coupling, and as a result of this Rashba type, we are going to have split the energy to spectra for the plus and minus Rashba band. Here are the Fermi uh, surfaces. And if we are thinking on about S-wave type of pairing in the system, then we can write the regular uh, S-wave type of order parameter. And in terms of the Rashba band, it's basically going to look like pairing in the minus Rashba band between two electrons and pairing between two electrons in the plus Rashba band. Each one of them look like a chiral P-wave superconductor, but with opposite chirality, so altogether we have conventional S-wave superconductor. Okay, now what happens when you apply magnetic field to the system? Basically, magnetic field is just going to shift the momentum in the direction perpendicular to the direction of the magnetic field, and therefore the center of the Fermi surface, of one Fermi surface, is going to shift down, while the center of the other Fermi surface is going to shift up, and obviously the spins are now not completely locked perpendicular to the direction of the Fermi surface, but will be tilted a bit. So now if we look at pairing of two electrons with opposite momentum, what we are going to see is that here, for example, the spins are no, no longer anti-parallel. And if we look at the other direction, so we spins are anti-parallel, but if one electron is on the Fermi surface, the other one is actually going to be shifted from the Fermi surface. So obviously such pairing is going to be affected by the presence of magnetic field, and magnetic field as without any spin orbit coupling is just going to cause pair breaking. However, what will happen now if instead of looking at pairs at just zero center of mass momentum, we will look at pairs with some finite center of mass momentum. So if we are looking just at the expression for the energy for an electron with momentum k, 
plus q over 2 and minus k plus q over 2. So they have total uh, center of mass momentum of q. You can see that the energy differ by this term. So where this term is basically plus minus depends whether we are in the plus or minus band, and sine theta is just the angle around the Fermi surface. If we can just set Q in such a way that this term is going to be zero, then there is no effect of magnetic field on the system at all. So basically, we can take the magnetic field to infinity and still get pairing. And indeed, if I'm choosing for either the plus or minus band, if I'm choosing Q to be just plus minus 2, two, a, two mu b over v Fermi, in principle, we can set this term to be 0. However, it can be only in one band, and we have only one choice of Q. And it will be just energetically more favorable to set this Q in such a way that the surface of pairing of the larger Fermi surface is going to be back looking like as if we don't have magnetic field in a Rashba type of spectrum. However, for the second Fermi surface, the smaller one, actually we are making the effect even worse. So as long as energetically it is, we are gaining energy from pairing electron on the, on the larger Fermi surface compared to the energy lost caused by the smaller Fermi surface, the system will be superconducting. So for just from this kind of energetic consideration, we can ask what will be the critical field, critical parallel magnetic field. And now we can see that the critical field, which usually the Pauli limit, is just delta or delta over 2, the gap without any uh, magnetic field, is now enhanced by a ratio of the spin orbit coupling to the gap without any magnetic field to some power that it depends on the details of the system, but basically goes between one half and two thirds. Now, if we are looking at what kind of superconducting state we have. So uh, yes. <laughs> otherwise, otherwise, actually, all this consideration is not going to apply. Yeah. Yes. Do you understand correctly, this is a Gerkov basic in PRL 2007, this result? This result, yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, up to some small modification, but yes, basically yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, what we are getting here is that the other parameter will, uh, will basically have finite momentum, and therefore what we get is some variant of the FFLO state, the full deferred relation of, Ch of Chinikov state. And when we think about FFLO state, one of the main problems in actually seeing them in nature is the fact that very small of amount of disorder usually kills completely the FFLO state. So one should ask what happens if we now add disorder to the system. And we can ask now how the critical field what we were asking, how the critical field change as we are cranking up disorder as a function of 1 over tau, 1 over the, over the scattering time due to disorder. And what we see is that, again, very small amount of disorder is going to kill the, the FFLO state and the critical magnetic field is going to drop back to the Pauli limit. Sorry, how is the calculation done here? Again? Uh, how is disorder created? In... Uh, Okay, so basically, in a complete regular way, how we are looking at disorder, basically we are averaging, looking at the instability in the presence of disorder, born approximation. So it's not consistent well. I mean, Yeah, is oh, a yeah. Here, or it's just no, no, self-consistent born approximation, yes. Okay, uh, but if we are being persistent and not stopping actually at this small amount of disorder, we can see that cranking up the disorder is actually going to revive the effect and instead of having the magnetic field just being, staying on the Pauli limit, it's actually going to increase back the critical field up to a value which is very similar to the initial value. And the maximum of the effect will be when the inverse scattering time is proportional to the spin orbit uh, 
coupling. If we will go further away and add more and more disorder, due to the yakonov perel type of mechanism, we are actually going to kill effectively spin-orbit coupling effect, and at the same time, obviously, the magnetic field will not, the critical field will not benefit anymore from spin-orbit coupling. So what we can see here, that unlike regular FFLO states that are dying very quickly with, uh, with impurities, here we have a large range of parameter space where we expect to see large increase of the critical field, and that, that is quite um, consistent with what is seen in experiment, for example, in this beryllium experiment. However, if we will look at what the, how TC behaves here as a function of magnetic field, there will be no, no enhancement. And in order to that, send in the enhancement, we should not stop in this kind of mean field level and ask what happened to the phase of the superconductor. No, 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 no. The Q vector is, is quite different, yes. So, 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 the Q is different. so if you always want to uh, put the bigger values of the fields, uh, then center to the center. So actually, that is only really correct in the clean limit. Once you are going and starting to have disorder in the system, you are actually going to scatter quite a lot the electron between the large Fermi surface to the small Fermi surface, and the Q will take some value, which is average, average between the size of the Fermi surface and, Q, and the Q vector of one Fermi surface and the size of the, ad, the small Fermi surface and its Q vector. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. It will basically depend on also on the diffusion coefficient. So there it will be disorder dependent to that. Yeah. Okay, so now let us assume that we are already in the superconducting uh, state and ask how, what, how does the free, the free energy of such system look like for a phase only type of model. So we will look at both the superconducting order parameter in assuming that it has some constant magnitude but allow phase fluctuations. In addition, we will allow magnetic fluctuation in the system due to the same interaction that cause actually superconductivity. And if we are writing now the Ginzburg-Landau type of equation, the first term will be just a regular phase stiffness type of term, just gradient of the phase square. And now because we have spin-orbit coupling in the system, we will get additional term. This additional term couples the gradient of the superconducting phase to the magnetic field, but here the magnetic field is basically the total magnetic field, and the coefficient of this term is proportional to the spin-orbit coupling. So once spin-orbit coupling goes to zero, this term also vanishes. And the magnetic field in our case will be either an external magnetic field or and just magnetic fluctuation in the system. Now, usually when we are thinking about superconductors, S-wave superconductors for sure, spin susceptibility in them should go to zero. And therefore, we usually don't think about what happens if we have magnetic fluctuation. They are basically irrelevant in the superconducting state. However, when we have spin-orbit coupling, we will actually have a term that looks like the spin susceptibility times the, this total magnetic field, and the spin susceptibility inside the superconducting state does not change much compared to its value in the normal state. So here we cannot neglect the spin susceptibility of the system, and which is consistent with the fact that we have actually coupling into the magnetic fluctuation in general. And last term, that, and that is actually, sorry, that was actually measured, the fact that spin susceptibility does not change much if we have spin orbit coupling uh, in superconductors. So here, measurement in uh, iridium uh, compound, where they are looking at the spin susceptibility as a function of temperature, basically spin susceptibility uh, just divided by the spin susceptibility at TC. And what we, they can see when they are looking at different direction, that in one direction there is no change at all in the spin susceptibility, in the other one there is 
it is slightly going down, but yet not going to zero at zero temperature as it should be for a conventional S-wave superconductor. And last term that we will have, just because we have the magnetic fluctuation, it's the mass of the magnetic fluctuation. Okay, so what is the first effect that we can see already coming from this new type of free energy is when we are writing the, super, the expression for the superconducting current, that it's not only proportional to the gradient of the phase, but it will have also contribution coming from the external field. And for example, that is part of the reason why when we are applying magnetic field, we are going to have finite momentum uh, pairing in the system without having any current, which is obviously cannot be in, in a regular system. In addition, we see now that the magnetization of the system is now not just proportional to any external magnetic field, but actually is also proportional to the gradient of the phase. And that means that if you are taking a superconductor and pushing current to it, superconducting current, it will have magnetization just perpendicular to the direction of the current. And if you will take now current and create a vortex in the system, now it will come with magnetization that is just pointing outside of the core of the system, and such magnetization is just resemble, resembling magnetic monopoles. S magnetic spin monopoles and not what is related to the magnetic flux of the system. And actually, when we will apply magnetic field to the system, it will interact with this magnetic monopole in the same way that, a mono, that electric charge interacts with an electric field. So now we can ask ourselves how this kind of unique relation between the magnetization and the current, or magnetization, and the gradient of the phase of the superconductor can affect the transition of the system into a phase coherent state and not only into the paired state. And what's the nature of? Nature of? Of that magnetization, the orbital magnetization? The one, the one that is going out, spin magnetization. It's just, and so? Uh, yes. Is, is there a simple answer to that? In, in general, if it basically comes from this term, and this term looks like a regular spin orbit coupling term. Instead of spin, we are speaking about magnetization. This H includes both magnetization and external field. But basically, if I'm replacing M by sigma, and the fact that the momentum is now not the momentum of a single electron, but momentum of the Cooper pairs, that's just the gradient of the phase. So basically from the fact that we add in our initial Hamiltonian K cross sigma, just going naturally to translate into mm -hmm. this term. Yeah. yeah so, so, so from the free energy, you say that if you apply an unplanned field, you get a current which is perpendicular to that which is in the superconducting phase? Is that what you mean? No. So applying, uh, applying current or pushing current to the system is not the same as applying magnetic field. Yeah. I mean, it, it cannot be that applying magnetic field will create current. What will happen? I can show that. Ah, sorry, back. Yeah. What will happen actually if you apply magnetic field, the phase will just adjust itself in such a way that the current is zero. And that is actually why we will always get this type of FFLO state when we are applying current because something needs to stop the current, if you want to think about that. Okay. So we are back to the free energy. And the next sta stage, what I will want to do is just integrate out the magnetic fluctuation and see what happened to the phase-only type of free energy. And it will be more convenient if instead of looking at continuous model, I will look at just model on the lattice, but that is just uh, for convenience. And now we can integrate the magnetization. And what we are getting is such a term that Again, just for convenience, instead of speaking about the superconducting phase, I will look at some effective spin. And in this effective spin, we have two terms. The first term, try to adjust the spins in the same direction, just to create phase coherence in the system, while the second term is actually trying to twist the phase to have 90 degrees degree angle between two adjacent sides. 
And the competition between these two effects will determine what will be the phase of the system. So we can just ask now how the, the superconducting phase is looking like. And what we are getting is the following phase diagram. Basically, we can look at the phase diagram as a function of one over the overall, the, the phase stiffness, and this parameter, which is basically the spin orbit couplings part. And on one side of our phase diagram, we will get a superconductor with basically a uniform superconducting phase. On the other side, we will get a superconductor with an helical phase, just the, fa the difference of the phase is going to be constant. So the phase is changing as a function of the position. But overall, what the second term is doing is to suppress the phase stiffness and create in the middle what look like just a Lifshitz point. Now, actually, this kind of phase diagram is quite generic when we think about magnetic systems, where we have both ferromagnetic interaction and anti-ferromagnetic interaction between next nearest neighbors. So we'll have a very similar type of phase diagram. For, that is one, for example, where we have a ferromagnetic state, helical type of state, paramagnetic state, and the Lifshitz point in, in between. Now, one of the things that are quite appealing in such an effect is that we manage to suppress the phase stiffness of the system without affecting much the pairing. So basically, if we can just by changing spin orbit coupling be somewhere where we suppress the, the phase stiffness quite dramatically, one can look at the physics of the Kosterit-Staulis or above Kosterit-Staulis transition in quite large range of temperatures, while usually when we think about superconducting film, the difference between the Kosterit-Staulis transition and the pairing transition is quite small, at least in conventional films. Now we can ask about magnetic field, because that was actually the motivation. So what happens if we add magnetic field to the system? So basically that's how it couples in the, in the spin language. And what we can see, the first effect will be that it will just slightly change and, and enhance the, super, the superfluid stiffness. However, that is, should be quite small effect. The other effect is that now we have helical phase, helical uh, superconducting phase for any value of the spin orbit coupling. And we can look now at the phase diagram for the system as a func for different values of magnetic field. And what if that was the phase diagram at zero magnetic field, now we can see that as we are going to higher and higher magnetic field, the we are going to enhance t the total superfluid stiffness and enhance, enhance TC of the system. Yes. Here? No, no, no. Okay. Uh, maybe it's written. That is a two dimensional XY model. It should be also Z there. Okay. If, if you want to properly, yeah. It should be all the fact that it's XY. So, yeah. There is that one comes with Z and that one comes with Z. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> so, so basically what we see here is that by applying magnetic field, we are suppressing the magnetic fluctuation that were that they were trying to compete between the ferromagnetic and this helical type of phase. And because of that, we will get higher and higher TCs to the system. If we want to look at how the gradient of the phase look like as a function of effectively the spin orbit coupling, so without any magnetic field, it looks like mag magnetization curve in magne regular magnetic system. And when we apply magnetic field, again, it looks like magnetization curve when we have just applying magnetic field on the system. So it looks very similar to just ferromagnetic type of transition, but now it is for the gradient of the phase. Now, if you are asking what, what else can we get actually in such system, beside of the enhancement of the magnetic field, 
So one of the things we look at is how, on the fact that we have now additional order parameter, which is not only the, the phase of the superconductor, but this kind of chiral uh, order in addition to the regular XY model. And if we want to plot the energy as a function of gradient of the phase, we can see that in the uniform phase, we are getting regular type of quadratic term, and then we turn into a Mexican N, which is just related to the fact that in the middle, we have just a second order phase transition in the system. Now, when I was plotting this kind of phase diagram, that was completely mean on the mean field level. Now one can ask, can we get something interesting if you are going beyond mean field? And that will be just a brief final part of my talk. And actually, if we are zooming in to the vicinity of the critical point, what we can see is that we can have in our phase diagram region where we are above the KT transition. However, we still have a chiral order in the system. And what one of the things that are open question for me and I'm, that I'm interested in is to understand what is the signature of this phase, if it will have any kind of unique signature. And by that, I'm just going to go back to the beginning and thank you for your attention.